queria agradecer a presença de todos. Todos falam português? Não. You don't speak Portuguese, so I guess I have to speak English. I'm just saying that I'm under some time constraints, so it will have to be a relatively brief meeting. But uh, thank you all for coming here to the Brazilian mission to the UN. You are all aware uh, of what brought me here. Yesterday, I think I had a contact with the press, with several of you present, uh, right after the five foreign ministers of the Mercosul countries had a meeting with the Secretary General. So I guess that was adequately covered. There are some uh, articles in the news today that adequately covered that. Um, but just to remind and recall, uh, we have circulated to member states through the Venezuelan rotating presidency of Mercosul, the decision that was adopted by heads of state of the Mercosul countries in Montevideo on 22nd of July. The title of the decision is Decision Rejecting the Acts of Espionage Conducted by the United States and the Countries of the Region. And um, the operative paragraphs of this decision requested uh, Mercosul countries to bring its contents to the attention of the United Nations. Um, in particular, uh, Argentina was charged with submitting the matter to the Security Council, which it did today through uh, the intervention by President Cristina Kirchner. Um, we were instructed, the member states, um, it didn't say at what level, but the fact that it was foreign minister's level, I think, uh, illustrates the importance attributed to this issue um, to um, jointly um, come into contact with the Secretary General of the uh, United Nations, which we did. And today you saw the debate on the relationship between the regional and the multilateral. Um, I think Argentina is to be commended for bringing this matter to the attention of the, Sec the Security Council during its presidency. First of all, through the high-level participation of President Kirchner herself, um, and it is obvious that uh, her initiative generated uh, considerable interest um, if one, uh, <laughs> uh, judging by the presence of 14 foreign ministers today, several council members, uh, but in addition to the council members who came at ministerial level, several foreign ministers from South America in particular. And I think even as I'm speaking to you, uh, there are still speeches going on. There were more than 30 countries inscribed under rule, what is the rule again, 37? 37, 39. 37, 39. Yeah. I used to work here, but I forget now the rules of procedure a little bit. Um, so from that perspective, uh, there's no question that this is considered a very timely initiative. And um, I personally thought that President Kirchner uh, presented the issue of the uh, espionage practices uh, very adequately um, in accordance with the uh, mandate that was uh, jointly uh, given by the Mercosul um, text that was circulated, as I mentioned to you. Well, you've heard the different interventions, and you have uh, seen that uh, they encompass various aspects of the Security Council work. Uh, I was very pleased in particular to see the uh, countries responsible for coordinating CELAC, which is the community of Latin American Caribbean countries uh, present at the Council for the first time. Uh, Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez of Cuba uh, making an intervention and then followed by the Foreign Minister of Peru um, who made a presentation on behalf of UNASUR countries, also highlighting the uh, ways in which the region has been working to diffuse tensions and actually transforming itself, uh, I think, to a large extent in a model of a zone of peace, democracy, cooperation, um, economic growth, social justice. 
very much in the spirit of what the UN Charter uh, would like to encourage around the world. Um, but even as we advance in our own agendas and one of the uh, points that was brought into the discussion were the um, discussions now taking place between the government of Colombia and the FARC uh, that will hopefully, and I think we are all very supportive of this process, um, eliminate from South America the last remaining uh, focus of armed conflict. Uh, it could really become an exemplary region in terms of cooperation around um, uh, the ideals that motivate the UN Charter. In my intervention, I, I highlighted not only um, the espionage decision, the advances made by UNASUR, for example, regarding transparency in military expenditures, um, the work of CELAC. Uh, I also uh, reminded council members of the Zone of Peace and Cooperation in the South Atlantic, ZOPACAS is the acronym, that is now being revived. It's existed for many years, but um, uh, recently uh, Uruguay, as the chair for ZOPACAS, organized a ministerial, joint ministerial meeting in Montevideo that brought together foreign ministers and defense ministers. And one of the aspects that I reminded council members was uh, our strong commitment to preserving the South Atlantic as a zone free of weapons of mass destruction, free from nuclear weapons, taking advantage of the fact that the America side uh, of the Atlantic is already a nuclear weapon free zone or, and a zone free of weapons of mass destruction under the Tlatelolco Treaty in particular and the fact that Africa is also a nuclear weapon free zone. Okay. Começamos uh, com português, first, Portuguese and Portuguese, if you don't mind. Sobre a espionagem, é, o senhor vê algum resultado no futuro, obviamente, mas um resultado prático no sentido, no documento do Mercosul, vocês mencionam sanções, eventualmente, para países que que infringam sobre os direitos de os outros países, especificamente na internet. É, você tem alguma expectativa de, de um, eventualmente, um acordo sobre uma, uma regulação da internet ou de, de atos de, de inteligência sem infringir direitos dos cidadãos de outros países? Bom, uh, essa temática ela envolve diferentes aspectos que são tratados em contextos variados do sistema multilateral. Desde as questões de segurança cibernética, que são debatidas, por exemplo, no âmbito da primeira comissão, aqui da Assembleia Geral da ONU, até questões relacionadas àquela, àquele processo que foi conhecido como cúpula da sociedade da informação, que é o processo que chega mais perto de uma regulação da internet. A internet... Um, ainda é um fenômeno relativamente recente, com características muito próprias. E a cúpula da sociedade da informação, ela criou uma plataforma para se debater é, diferentes aspectos da questão, desde questões éticas até questões técnicas de telecomunicações, etc. E há em curso um processo que se chama o aprimoramento, não é isso? O aprimoramento... Um, da sociedade da informação, aonde uh, certas questões podem ser levantadas. Há uma agência especializada das Nações Unidas, a UIT, a União Internacional de Telecomunicações, sediada em Genebra, que lida com questões técnicas re relacionadas a telecomunicações, por exemplo. É, não há um consenso, é, no momento, sobre uma governança inter intergovernamental, fica parecendo tautológico, mas não é, é intergovernamental da internet. A governança ela, ela é feita por uma instituição privada, público-privada norte-americana, como vocês sabem. Mas eu acho que estão dadas as condições para que se avance nesse debate. E, por outro lado, existem questões aqui que uh, envolvem direitos uh, individuais do cidadão, direitos humanos, 
onde certos textos já negociados, existentes, podem ser invocados. A própria alta comissária para direitos humanos fez isso numa declaração bastante abrangente, que ela divulgou, por coincidência, no mesmo dia da decisão do Mercosul, 22 de julho, e que eu recomendo muito a leitura. Ela é, ela é ampla e específica e detalhada. Mas, só para concluir aqui, é, você falou em resultados práticos. Eu posso comentar, por exemplo, que já existe um país que está propondo é, um protocolo adicional ao Pacto sobre Direitos Civis e Políticos, né, que é um dos instrumentos internacionais que contém dispositivos que versam sobre o direito à, à privacidade, uh, para especificar mais ainda como é que esses direitos devem ser uh, resguardados, protegidos na era da internet. Então, já estamos caminhando um pouquinho até mais rápido do que podíamos imaginar. Diga. O Brasil pretende perdoar, pretende rever a política de perdão da dívida dos países africanos? Bom, eu estou mais conversando aqui sobre o que eu vim fazer em Nova York, né? E, enfim, por mais importante que a África seja para o Brasil, neste momento eu não estou tratando dessa questão. Mas foi, eu chamaria a atenção de vocês que estão interessados na questão do perdão da dívida, que vai ser divulgado uma nota de esclarecimento, não é isso? Ah, acabou de ser divulgada. Então, acho que a nota é autoexplicativa e ela, inclusive, corrige algumas distorções que são fruto de desconhecimento da geografia africana, né? porque eu acho que um jornal brasileiro, não sei qual foi, interpretou que a Guiné Equatorial estava tendo a dívida perdoada. Guiné Equatorial é um país muito rico, não tem dívida. É um país mais credor do que devedor e não tem dívida com o Brasil. A Guiné, que sim tem uma dívida com o Brasil, que está sendo perdoada, é a Guiné Conakry, que é um país... Uh, governada por um uh, líder democraticamente eleito, um campeão das liberdades individuais, que esteve exilado uh, muitos anos na França, o presidente Alfa Condé. Hum? Essa é a nota que foi divulgada. Está bem. Então, não teria nada a acrescentar. Mr. Minister, thank you. This is from the Spanish desk of Associated Press. Um, we'll get to you. Not, uh, thank you. Excuse me? All right. It's okay. I'm not, She's I'm, speaking, I'm not speaking English, speaking English. I don't speak we Portuguese. I'm sorry. Oh, well, there have been there have been two Portuguese ah. questions. Oh, yeah, you're right about that. So let's be disciplined. É, eu queria te perguntar, eu vi na agenda oficial que tinha um encontro, o senhor tinha um encontro com a Cristina Kirchner. Queria, o que foi discutido, se teve alguma, alguma coisa? Foi um encontro de cortesia, na verdade. Ela é a presidente do Conselho de Segurança, nesse momento. E, na verdade, eu fui antecipar uma cópia do discurso que eu faria hoje para ela. E conversamos sobre a oportunidade do tema que ela propôs para o debate aberto no Conselho de Segurança e formas também de cooperarmos aqui no âmbito das Nações Unidas. Não, não houve. Agora sim, por favor, só porque ela tinha começado. Ok. So you're the first in the English. I mean, you interrupt me, and if you don't mind, thank you. But everyone will get their opportunity to ask questions. But can I ask, or she has to ask first? Okay. I don't know who lifted their arm first. I just tried to ask a question. You are the Mr. arbitrator. Ms. Ronda, please, I'm working, I'm on deadline. Okay. Okay. Uh, this, thank you. It's for the Spanish desk of Associated Press. Um, if you could specify, um, I don't know, about the mechanisms, the United Nations, um, sorry, at Mercosur, uh, you asked to the UN, um, you, you, you decided to, to, to ask to the UN, use mechanism uh, to control uh, or seize this espionage. Uh, then you that you have in here, I've been, you have been talking that to the UN. Which are the mechanisms they are going to be um, on the table to work with? Well, to I end think the I've, sanctions? I've just answered this question in Portuguese. Maybe uh, I'm not sure if you understood, but I gave certain examples of items in the agenda of the General Assembly, where certain uh, debates are already inscribed in the agenda. For example, on cybersecurity under the first committee or on the follow-up to the Summit on the Information Society, which, was, uh, which provides a platform for discussing issues such as ethics in the uh, realm of uh, the Information Society. And UNESCO, for example, in Paris, 
has a role to play within that context. There is the third committee which deals with human rights issues, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, where there are already debates, uh, ongoing debates, for example, about freedom through the internet. And you know these debates can be expanded to include the question of privacy and uh, the protection of rights that are assured by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and by the International Covenant on Civilian and Political Rights. I mentioned that even there is one delegation who is already proposing a, um, an addendum, a, a protocol additional, additional to the covenant. Um, I would prefer for the delegation to uh, reveal uh, his or herself uh, in due course, because at this time it's still being discussed within a informal uh, group. Uh, but you know, this is a very concrete proposal that is already uh, uh, being um, presented uh, in the context of the human rights uh, discussions. Um, did I give any more examples? No, this is as specific as I can get at this point. But sorry, um, about sanctions, uh, I think you talked yesterday about a possible... Well, the the word possible sanction, it appears in a very broad sense. You know, there are, um, I think one has to be mindful here of um, two situations. On one hand, there are already international instruments that guarantee certain rights, such as the Covenant on Civilian Political Rights guarantees the right to privacy, or the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which guarantees the inviolability, does one say that in English? Uh, Non-violability of diplomatic missions. So there it's a question of enforcing and uh, ensuring that those rights are protected. There are other areas where there are gaps, lacunae, uh, where you would need to promote um, new instruments. And this is where you know the idea of mechanisms that may prevent and sanction uh, practices that uh, go against the uh, sovereign equality of states, the state sovereignty, uh, and that are detrimental to the kind of you know international uh, cooperation that we would like to see and that uh, the UN Charter encourages you know uh, through transparency. I think I'm, I could also mention here the Open Government Partnership Initiative, which is a an initiative that really runs parallel to the United Nations. It's not a UN initiative as such. Um, countries join on a voluntary basis. Uh, President Dilma Rousseff was among the leaders who launched it in September 2011. And that uh, provide for, I had the statute right here with me this morning, transparency in, in governmental uh, practices and initiatives, you know, among many others. Mm -hmm. So here. Yes, uh, Joseph Klein from Canada Free Press. Uh, my question is going to be sort of a devil's advocate question, if you will. Um, the United States, of course, justifies its surveillance program on the grounds of fighting global terrorism, and we've seen just in the last few days the closing of embassies across the Middle East and North Africa because of, it, of intelligence gathered through electronic surveillance. There have been reports um, of terrorist presence uh, Al-Qaeda included, Hezbollah, Hamas, some uh, countries recognize them as terrorists, in Venezuela, in Argentina, and even in, in, in Brazil, there was a report in 2011 in Vieja magazine uh, alleging that there were at least 20 operatives from Al-Qaeda and, and um, uh, Hezbollah and other terrorist groups uh, using Brazil as a hub. So. If, if there is a valid concern about the spread of terrorism into the Latin America and its close proximity to the United States, do you see that as so, somewhat of a, a, a perhaps a reason for the uh, U.S.'s uh, electronic surveillance? And uh, do you think, if not, do you see any other means to help combat that? Thank you. Well, first of all, I think those reports you refer to are unconfirmed reports. Uh, we have already in place uh, mechanisms for consultation with the United States and others in the region on precisely these kinds of questions, and there have never been, there has never been a confirmation that uh, these groups are operating in our territory, or, for example, in what is known as a trilateral, tri, what is it called again, uh, yes. tripartite border, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, joining Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, you, you, we may even provide you with statements from um, 
the joint uh, intergovernmental group that looks at these issues uh, that declare officially that you know the reports are not confirmed. So you know, that's one aspect of the question. Uh, the other aspect is that, well, you know, Security Council resolutions, uh, more recently the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the presidential statement we adopted today at the Security Council uh, repeats a simple idea, which is, you know, terrorism, um, other scourges, um, drug trafficking, uh, illicit uh, arms trafficking, etc. All these uh, are, of course, um, matters of grave concern uh, that we treat very seriously, but they must be uh, combated through respect for international law, respect for human rights, respect for uh, international humanitarian law. So I, I guess this is the simple answer to your question. Yes, I'm Rhonda Haubin, and I'm, I write for, um, for Tageszeitung's online site. Uh, and um, my question is that you made is very important to speak to the Secretary General and to ha have five ministers come and present to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, what did you feel was the importance of that? That's not necessarily obvious to others, so, but you mm -hmm. felt it was, you know, the Mercosur felt it was important. And did you feel that, in fact, what you were trying to achieve there was achie achieved? And also the presenting to the Security Council, is that, you know, is, has that been a, mm -hmm. achieved with what you were hoping to? And then the right. sec other question has to do with what's happening with the responsibility <coughs> while protecting because mm -hmm. it's, these issues are very complex in some ways and need, need mm -hmm. ha have us updated as to what's going on. Right. Well, I think the Venezuelan foreign minister put it very well yesterday when he spoke to the press. Unfortunately, not all uh, of you understand Spanish. Um, and he, of course, holds the rotating presidency of Mercosur. He said that this is a message of alert, an alert that is being sent uh, through the meeting with the United Nations Secretary General to the international community. Now, it is without precedent for five countries that you know are, are members of the United Nations since 1945 um, that today uh, represent democracies uh, trying to overcome their domestic challenges through policies that are reducing inequality, promoting economic growth, strengthening regional cooperation, uh, members of a part of the world that is uh, uh, notoriously devoid of conflict and, and a um, laboratory for an experiment in regional integration that I think is quite unique. Uh, you know, many today mentioned in the Security Council debate that South America is poised to become an example of a zone of peace and cooperation. And uh, I've already referred to the situation of Colombia, which is a specific uh, situation within the continent. Uh, the fact that these five foreign ministers come to New York, have a meeting with the Secretary General to send this alert about something that um, they consider serious, I think is uh, in itself a very uh, important gesture and sends a very strong message. Uh, the fact that the Secretary General reacted in a way which we all considered positive, sharing the concerns, consider considering that this initiative is valid, of course, um, met our objective uh, at this point and at this stage. Similarly, um, the Mercosul decision included a paragraph that stated that uh, uh, we request the Argentine Republic to submit this matter to the Security Council for its consideration. So now we have fulfilled another uh, part of the mandate from the decision of, uh, actually it's 12th July 2013. I was reading another date, uh, yeah, 12th July. Um, so we are accomplishing the mandate that was given to the, uh, through our heads of state in Montevideo to um, enlist the matter, um, so to speak, in the international agenda through uh, different manifestations. You also asked about responsibility while protecting. I think uh, this is an initiative that we took during our two-year tenure in the Security Council 2010-2011. And that, um, well, you, you know the objectives, you are familiar with it, the ideas and the text that was circulated. And um, from our perspective, I think it's been a very successful um, initiative. Uh, uh, it has generated considerable interest uh, among governance worldwide. Um, 
there are a number of debates in the academic world. For example, there was just one now in England at the University of Hull. Yeah, Hull, H-U-L-L, in, in Britain, uh, devoted precisely to R2P and where RWP, you know, had its own kind of a special segment. It found its way into the report of the Secretary General to the General Assembly, or not the Secretary General, the Special Advisor. Which, which was the use in this? Right. Um, and, you know, I, I I've, uh, encourage you to read the report because 10 paragraphs in the report deal precisely with the uh, Brazilian points that are made in the RWP text. So, to a large extent, you know, the ideas, the concept, the spirit that in which uh, they were presented, and the kind of um, uh, more responsible behavior that Brazil would like to see introduced into uh, initiatives that aim at protecting civilians has met fertile ground. Uh, I think the challenge now is to reinforce the non-military approaches to the protection of civilians, because it's becoming more and more clear that the military approach generates very unpredictable consequences that sometimes um, uh, one loses control of the process and you generate more suffering among civilians, more death, more refugees, more internally displaced, more material destruction than other strategies would produce. So this is very much the, the, the call that we are making. You know, let's try to avoid the stronger medicine uh, that has the side effects that can in fact, run counter to the objectives that we are aiming for, and let's reinforce all these strategies that um, that enhance cooperation, prevention, um, protecting civilians through diplomatic Pacific means. Uh, Matthew Lee, uh, Inner City Press. I wanted to ask you two things about your, the speech that you gave today. One was about NATO, mm -hmm. where you, you, know, you expressed some concern of how they interpret their own mandate. And I think I mean, the Secretary General has signed some agreement between the UN and NATO that Russia complained at the time, and then it all kind of went under the bridge. I wonder, what do you think of that? What should be the relationship, not only of the Security Council, but of the Secretariat with NATO? And then I saw that you mentioned the Congo, which I cover, and you said that there's the Brazilian general that now is the, military, is the force commander of MONUSCO, but recently, they, they announced this ultimatum. They had to give 48 hours for armed groups to either disarmed or be neutralized. They, so I wondered... They were referring... Who well, I'm are, saying Manusco. Manusco oh, announced okay. uh, recently, in the last mm -hmm. week, they gave this... Uh, people were pretty surprised because it sounded like mm -hmm. a... It was interpreted as, as kind of declaration of war on the rebels. And I just mm -hmm. wonder, I mean, I understand just because he's a Brazilian national doesn't mean you have any particular mm -hmm. control over him. But the mm -hmm. UN seems to, be, seems to mm -hmm. be taking a more robust or sort of force centered approach to peacemaking in the, in the in the Democratic Republic of Congo and I, I'm not sure if, it, if what do you think does it does it is it consistent with the ideas you're promulgating or, or and what do you I mean because he's a he's a Brazilian general there what do you, what do you think of an ultimatum well to starting group? with the second question first of all I think that um, the strategy that is being uh, developed with the Congo it uh, meets the kind of requirements that I consider essential to the extent that it's been authorized by the Security Council, by a specific resolution. Not only authorized, but I think a consensus resolution. So, you know, the African countries agree with this strategy and the rest of the Security Council uh, membership also. That is already one uh, very important aspect of what, it, what is being attempted. Um, now, the Congo has been a particularly violent, destructive, um, pernicious uh, 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 conflict with uh, women suffering violence of all kinds. And uh, uh, that uh, has been festering for too long. So um, uh, it seems that uh, the notion that you should maybe try a, a new approach um, has its logic. And of course, uh, the point that I made today is that um, having a more robust military presence, UN presence, well, it's an innovation to some degree. We have to see how well that works uh, for that to be used as a precedent for other conflicts. Uh, but it is not an end in itself. It has to be placed within a diplomatic strategy, uh, pressuring the countries that are, um, you know, instigating and uh, fueling uh, this violence to um, modify their behavior, to abide by the agreements that have been reached. There was a very important agreement in Addis Abeba uh, a few months ago that joined um, the main uh, players, the main stakeholders regarding this um, very serious conflict, but that is not being adequately implemented. So um, I also mentioned in the statement that we 
agree with the representative Mary Robinson, Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland and former High Commissioner on Human Rights. Um, well, you have the text. You got the idea. The other question was regarding NATO. I think the the, the speech today is quite a, quite self-explanatory. Um, I was giving examples of uh, uh, situations that are of systemic concern. Uh, I think this would be the, the best explanation I could give here. Um, first of all, the fact that NATO is not clearly inscribed uh, as a Chapter 8 uh, regional organization. It keeps a certain ambigu ambiguity regarding its own status vis-a-vis -vis the UN Charter. Um, and it's a defense alliance. Um, uh, so a defense alliance normally would um, concern itself with defending the territory of its members. But here you have other ambiguities as well. This is what the text points out. So my point is really, from a systemic point of view, if you have other groups of countries doing the same thing, uh, and we know that in the past NATO considered that uh, perhaps there would be situations where an explicit authorization for the use of force would not be required from the Security Council. Um, it is also, uh, through some of its strategic concepts, considered the possibility of acting out of area, or so uh, further away from the North Atlantic or uh, the regions bordering on the North Atlantic and, and on the member states. Um, these, these are, I think the word I use is problematic, because if you take another group of countries in another different region of the world and, and they start developing similar strategic concepts, well, you will have a situation of increasing tension rather than the kind of increasing cooperation that a country like Brazil would like to see internationally. So, I I ask you take na verdade, nova embaixadora representante na, na missão. Tudo bem, era o primeiro dia dela, mas é, é, ela estava ali na Berlinda, uhum. sem dúvida. né é, Queria ouvir do senhor a sua avaliação sobre a posição americana, especificamente na questão da espionagem. O senhor acha que as explicações são satisfatórias? É, enfim, a opinião. Bom, muito brevemente, em primeiro lugar, dizer que a nova representante de dos Estados Unidos é uma amiga pessoal minha, uh, ela se interessa muito pela diplomacia brasileira, ela escreveu um livro sobre Sérgio Vieira de Mello, que vocês conhecem, foi ex-subsecretário-geral para assuntos humanitários, ex-alto comissário das Nações Unidas para Direitos Humanos e esteve em praticamente todos os continentes do mundo, trabalhando para as Nações Unidas, em uma capacidade ou outra, e, e alguém que nós sabemos é movida por, por uh, ideais, assim, uh, de cooperação internacional, de respeito pelo direito internacional. Uh, ela é uma das uh, idealizadoras de uma iniciativa que eu mencionei aqui numa outra resposta, que é a Open Government Partnership, né, sobre a transparência uh, nas ações governamentais. E, e portanto, uh, a nossa expectativa é de que a cooperação com a delegação norte-americana em Nova York, na ONU, sob a... Uh, o comando da embaixadora Samantha Power será a melhor possível. Sobre a relação dos Estados Unidos, eu, um, as explicações dadas até o momento ao Brasil não são consideradas suficientes, isso aí eu já declarei, e é por isso mesmo que nós estamos estabelecendo um diálogo para obter esclarecimentos adicionais. E eu acho que é bom lembrar também, quer dizer, sem me pronunciar muito sobre o que está acontecendo internamente nos Estados Unidos, mas vocês acompanham, há um debate... Um, no próprio Congresso norte-americano, que tem abordado essas questões uh, mediante um, uh, reações muito interessantes, porque elas não obedecem à polarização habitual republicanos versus democratas. Né? Existem republicanos que consideram que tem havido abusos, que limitam os direitos humanos da população da cidadania norte-americana. No Congresso americano, o debate é mais sobre os direitos dos cidadãos norte-americanos. Acho que eles não estão... Uh, pelo menos no momento, uh, tratando muito da questão internacional. E existem também do lado democrata, uh, representantes e personalidades que estão preocupados. Eu acho que é um debate que está só apenas iniciando e vai ser muito interessante acompanhá-lo de mais perto. É isso. Sorry? If it's a quick one. Yes. Uh, it, it just seems the que question is with how can it be any UN business if in fact the US is in control of all the communication that everybody is 
is gathering and everybody is participating in. So is well, this... My is answer, my quick answer is that the UN becomes even more important in situations like this where you have to strengthen mechanisms for international cooperation. And uh, I was just answering in Portuguese that uh, uh, the new permanent representative of the U.S. to the United Nations is someone I know well, a personal friend, someone we admire, uh, someone who has taken strong interest in Brazilian diplomacy and in the work of a Brazilian national, Sergio Vila de Mel, who's devoted his life to the United Nations. So by implication, you have to um, conclude that she is someone very much committed to uh, a strong multilateral system that is functional and that benefits the largest possible number of people around the world. Thank you so much.